Hi there, my name is Steve Bassett and today we're going to be taking a look at a piece of software called Registax 6. This software is primarily used by astrophotographers for, for processing um, video footage of the planets and the moons and turning them into some pretty, some pretty impressive images. Um, you also see it being used for solar photography uh, and on a very odd occasion you do see it being used for deep sky photography but that's not, not very common. Uh, first port of call, you're going to want to visit the Registax website, I'll drop a link in the description at the bottom of the video. And it has quite a lot of information on here. Um, it's worth taking a very quick look at this preview tab up here. Um, this gives a lot of instructions about what you're actually going to be doing and how to do things. Um, it can get quite involved. It's, um, it's definitely worth having a look at, but I think sometimes the videos um, certainly certainly help to get your head around what a lot of this does and to be honest with you you don't need to do too much in the way of playing with the settings um, we'll come into that shortly I'll sort of uh, run through a process with you um, hopefully you'll be able to follow so firstly what you want to be doing obviously is you want to go ahead and download Registax I'm using the most up-to-date version there's no problems with it so I'd recommend going ahead and downloading that Okay, so once you've downloaded and installed uh, Registax 6, you'll end up obviously with a shortcut on your desktop. So you can go ahead and uh, open it. So the program starts up fairly quickly, um, and you'll notice straight away there's lots and lots of settings to be playing with. Um, there's not a great deal to, there's, there's a few settings that, that you will need to, to sort of have a play with. There's, there's a lot of stuff is down to personal preference, but you can get through and end up with a decent image without doing too much to be honest with you. It actually um, it actually is quite simple. It's a lot easier than, than what a lot of people think. I think a lot of people start the software up and see everything and think it's, it, is, it can be quite intimidating but it really isn't isn't too bad at all. Um, so the first thing we want to be doing, obviously we've, we've been out at night, got some footage of uh, a planet or the moon and we want to come in and start processing it. So the first thing we want to be doing is we need to open up our video footage. Uh, so we just need to see Ideally, it's it's already highlighted in orange for us. It tells us that that's basically telling us that that's something that we need to click on. So we want to go ahead and hit select. So I've got this pre-made footage of Jupiter that I took back in March 2014, which we're going to use for this. Uh, so it's just a, literally a case of clicking on that. It's actually something that's worth mentioning. Sometimes when you open it for the first time, you may find it'll be set to TIFF frames. That's obviously it's not going to show any any of your video footage. You just need to make sure that the top file type is set to video, and then it should show all the videos that you have. And obviously, you need to navigate to wherever you've stored your videos. So I just go ahead and open up your video, and there we have our video. Let's maximise the screen. So that has our video there, and we can actually run through the video if you just hold down on the up arrow. It'll run through the video of Jupiter all the way. You can see it counting up the frames just down the bottom. Uh, you can see that I've, I've got just over 2,000 frames of video footage of Jupiter that I took. I think it's about three minutes worth of video, something like that. Pop that back to the start. So the first thing we want to be doing, and ideally it's, it's, it's underlined in green for us, is we need to set our align points. Um, Again, there's lots of settings that can be used uh, to sort of you, you can manually add set, you can manually add your uh, alignment points if you want to. Um, to be honest, I think the computer does a pretty good job most of the time of doing it itself. The only real option that I tend to change is is this one here. Um, if you look at the instructions, you'll see there's there's lots of information on the website about about this, these particular settings, uh, and it does recommend that default is the setting that you would use on an image that fills the whole of the screen. Um, so a close-up of the moon, for example, would take up this entire frame. As we're using, the actual thing we're interested in is only quite small in comparison to, to, the, to the size of the screen. They recommend that the 3x3 three three area setting is the one to go for. Now, I'm not entirely sure why. I don't, I don't understand fully how, how it works. Um, don't really need to, to be honest with you. I'm just following the instructions on the website of what they recommend. But play with it. The best thing to do is, is to play with it yourselves, and um, see what works best for you. So, as I say, we've got a quite a small area of interest. So we're going to keep the three by three area selected. We're not going to touch any of these settings down. Well, this lot here. Um, I'll come on to the limit setup 
shortly. I think we'll go through the actual alignment process first and then, then we can adjust that. Something I do else, else I do like to do is obviously we like to leave it in colour. You can turn the colour off. Doesn't make a massive amount of difference in this particular image, but it might do in some of them. Um, show full frame, you can just basically it gives you a bit of a zoomed view. Um, and something else I like to have is the registration graph switched on, which is this graph on the right. It's empty at the minute because we haven't actually done any registration. So we go ahead and we just click the align points and see what it comes up with. So straight away you can see it's selected five align points for us straight off the bat. Um, basically the align points are areas where you can get changes in contrast or changes of detail. It's basically just something that the software can use to try to align all of these frames together as we go ahead and start to start the alignment process. So we can go ahead and do that now. I'm happy we're just going to leave those five, five alignment points and see what we end up with at the end. So now what the software is doing, as you can see down in the bottom left, is just it's just aligning all 2,000 of these frames for us. Um, it depends on how fast your computer is as to how quick it'll do this. Um, I've had computers in the past where it does seem to take an age, but this, this one's not too bad. Okay, so after the computer's finished aligning all of our frames, you end up with a registration graph with some information in it. Um, and what the software also does based on the align points you set it will select your best frame and put that at the start and then the worst frame will be at the very end so if we use the left and right arrows you can see if you look down in the uh, down in the bottom left you can see that we're, 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 we're clicking through the frames and you can see that they're no longer in order instead of actually being in numerical order they've now been replaced and put into order of quality um, and again, if you look on the registration graph, you can see the blue bar as we scroll through is slowly moving along all of the frames. Uh, this is it's at this point now that really we want to select how many of these frames we want to use. Obviously, we don't want to put too many poor quality frames into the final image. But at the same time, we don't want to have too few frames because obviously we want to try and keep our signal to noise ratio good um, in order to you know to try and stamp out that horrible noise. Uh, so this is where we come in, into the limit setup. Um, so if at the minute you can see that I, I do tend to always use best frame percentage. It's, uh, it's really is the easiest way to do it. Um, and you can see as we change this percentage figure, you can see the blue bar on the registration graph is moving to correspond. Um, I, if you look at that quality line, you can see the quality doesn't really drop drastically. Um, it's not looking too bad, so I will probably tend to leave leave things at about 80%. I do tend to use 80% most of the time, to be honest with you, unless there's some real significant changes in that in that registration graph. So we'll just go ahead and leave it at 80% um, and see how things look at the end. Again, you can always come back and, and try try different settings. There's no that's, that's that's the beauty of it. You can try one thing. If it doesn't work, come come back and have another go. So after we've selected what. Um, what limit of frames that we're gonna that we're gonna stick with and like I say I'm gonna go with eighty percent we just need to go ahead and hit the limit and that basically locks in that that decision um to use eighty percent of the frames. Uh, I'm not entirely clear what the yellow circles with the green lines indicate. Um I've always wondered I haven't haven't really found any information so if anybody does know by all means leave a comment in the box it'd be interesting to know. Uh next it takes us on to the stacking page. So now we've selected our eighty percent of the best frames, and as you can see, that is that is equates to uh, 1,601 frames uh, that we're going to stack. Um, so what it's going to do now is going to take all 1,600 frames and stack them on top of of each other uh, to give us our final image. I don't tend to play with any of the settings in this stacking. I don't. Um, I've never needed to. I've never never really looked into what what they do. Um, it, it all just seems to work without it so all we're going to go ahead and do uh, th mm, I suppose you could if you wanted to there's there's drizzling um, which as you can see when active stacking it's probably worth just reading that when active stacking will be done using drizzling and drizzling factor creating a two times enlarged final image. Sometimes that looks quite good again that's something you can check um, switch it on do a stack if it doesn't look very good switch it off and stack again it's not um, it's not the end of the world I tend not to use it too much um, it doesn't always look that good when I when I do it that could just be my equipment not not capable of 
of, of capturing good enough footage perhaps um, but yeah we'll just go ahead and stack I think we're ready to go so just click the stack button uh, and again you see the percentage bar bottom left working again it's the same as before this will be down to obviously the number of frames you're stacking and the speed of your computer will determine how long this takes okay so the computer's now finished stacking our 1600 frames and has given us an image uh, to look at uh, as you can see straight away it's looking considerably better than before we started stacking in fact if we go back to the align tab at the top here you can see um, let's just make it full frame there we go you can see it's quite noisy quite grainy um, but as soon as it's finished doing its stacking you can see again let's just increase that it smoothed it out quite a lot um, some of the surface details now really starting to to show out we've got some banding um, possibly great red spot there and I think we may have a moon moon as well that we've caught um, so that's really all there is to it uh, the only final little bit we need to do um, now is a little bit of post-processing in Registax obviously you can still go into something like Photoshop or, or GIMP um, and, and, and process it till your heart's content but in Registax there's this final tab at the top here called Wavelet um, which basically just gives us the tools to to sharpen sharpen our image a little bit um, I don't tend to use any of these these functions up here um, they just tend to stay as they are again I haven't really looked at, that, at what they do you don't really need to for, for sort of this basic tutorial um, something a new feature that was added in Registax 6 was this ability to use linked wavelets uh, some people like it, some people don't. Um, as you can see, so, so um, it, which is quite good as you hover over when active, the settings of a higher wavelet layer will affect the next layer. So basically, what that's saying, I think, is that as you adjust one, it has a slight effect on the other. Um, I'm not a great fan of it, to be honest with you. Um, I quite like, I quite like to to to, to leave them working separately I think I think it for me personally it gives a it gives a better better image at the end uh, but obviously again it's all down to personal preference so what we need to be doing is really just just um, playing around with these sliders now and as you can as you can see every time we, we let go of the mouse we move it let go of the mouse it'll change the image a little uh, begin to start sharpening it up really bring some of that detail of the planet out uh, so we can just play around with these really until until your heart's content. Something that you might notice if you get too aggressive with it, you can see just in fact if we go over to this, we'll, we'll go into these functions in a minute, but um, there's the option to, to, to get a zoomed view of the planet. Um, and basically what we need to do is, if you, you can increase your zoom up here, so we go right in as far as it'll let us, which is four times. If we hold down the control key and move our mouse around on the disk you can see that it'll move the zoomed view for us all the time we've got the, the control key held so you can see some of the, these rings are starting to to appear which is a bit of a unwanted side effect of sharpening so we just we can either back the sharpening off a little or we can use the denoise you can add a little bit of denoise which will help to just smooth out these rings um, and the, the downside of this is it will unsharpen the image a little bit, um, so you've got to try and find a balance. It's not uh, it's not easy. It's literally really is just a case of playing around with these sliders until you get something that 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 you that you're happy with. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time doing it because you, you you know you can you can spend hours doing it if you wanted to. Um, it's really just to give you an idea of of what they're doing. Um, so there. That's probably a little bit over the top, but we'll leave it like that for now. That's that's fine. Uh, something else you can do um, that is quite often good is occasionally you may find you get some some uh, chromatic aberration. You get some some colour differences around the edges of the planets. You can sometimes clear that up with this RGB align function. Um, just need to make your box that appears just get it to cover the whole of the area that you want to to actually have checked just like this um, you don't need to really play with it just hit the estimate button and it'll it'll run through it for you you can see it working bottom left corner again it's just aligning all of the all the, all the color channels for you sometimes it makes a difference sometimes it doesn't it's just something really that you can play with um, you can do a lot of other things here color mixing I mean I don't tend to play with them too much you can you can view the histogram if you like you can see our RGB channels are fairly fairly well aligned anyway so um, 
that's really all there is to it. Um, there's not anything else really that I tend to use. And this, the only th you can maybe play with the color of, uh, sorry, the contrast and brightness a little bit. Let's just clear that RGB alignment tool away. Um, I don't tend to adjust brightness, contrast maybe. You can tweak the contrast a little. Again, it all comes down to to your own personal preference. I mean, you can see actually we've actually ended up with two moons in the image. Um, great red spot. Got some nice banding detail. Um, it's not by any means the best Jupiter image in the world, but it's good. It's uh, you know it's certainly for someone who's just starting out. It um, it's very good. Um, so it'd certainly be one to be pleased with. And that's I think that's all we can really really talk about. Uh, the next phase really is just to go ahead and save. Um, what you will find, you see there's this dual button here, uh, something that you will find not so much in this image but if you were doing say for example um, some work on the moon and you had the full frame was actually full of an image, of the moon, like a close up of the moon, you'd notice that as you were adjusting these sliders and sharpening the image only a, only a small area would actually be sharpening, almost gives you a preview of, of, of what your sharpening is doing, it doesn't sharpen the whole image at once. So what you need to do is once you're happy with this area that has sharpened up, you, you like how it's looking, you need to go ahead and click this dual button and it will then do the whole thing, do, it will um, sharpen the whole image for you. Um, it's not, if you forget, it's not the end of the world because what will happen is, and I can just show you if we just tweak this setting back a little bit, if I accidentally went and hit the save image button before hitting do all it actually reminds you that you haven't you haven't uh, sharpened the whole image and ask you if you'd like to perform it now um, so obviously the answer would be yes and uh, that's all there is to it and go ahead and save it I, I always tend to save as a 16-bit tiff um, call it whatever you like give it a name and uh, store it and that's all there is to it um, obviously any questions please leave them in the comments box below I'll do my best to answer them um, and yeah that's everything thanks very much for watching